This episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Loctite's Pro Foam. Say no to inefficient and drafty. Say yes to Loctite's new Pro Foams. Loctite's Pro Foam line features three new products. The gaps and cracks and window and door items seal and insulate gaps and fit any standard foam gun applicator. Loctite's Fireblock Pro Foam fills gaps while resisting the migration of fire and smoke. Perfect for electrical, plumbing, and wherever a fire-resistant foam is needed. Say yes to Loctite's new Pro Foams. Say yes to Loctite. Visit loctiteproducts.com for more information. Hey, podcast listeners, be sure to check out Fine Home Building's e-learning opportunities. We've created a special discount coupon just for you. Learn about sustainable home building, using mini split heat pumps, insulation, finished carpentry, and more. See all of what's available at courses.finehomebuilding.com and then use the special code PODCAST20 for a discount on any class. That's PODCAST20 in all caps. Thanks for listening. AC and DC uh, discussions uh, in cities around the country. You know, I'm guessing this will get worked out, but I'm not sure we're there yet. Yeah. Uh, When when you started that topic, Patrick, I thought, how old are you? What do you mean? The the beginning? (laughs) It reminds you of the beginning of AC wearing. I'm like, geez, you got to be 120 (laughs) years old. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, a weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building Technical Editor Mark Peterson. Hello. Fine Home Building Contributing Editor and TDS Custom Construction Production Manager Ian Schwant. Hello. And our Senior Producer Jeff Rose. Hi. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, it is a pleasure to see you guys this morning. Thanks for being here. Yeah, good to see you guys. Oh, man. So uh, it's turned to fall, it seemed like today. You were just saying, Ian, unseasonably cool in the Midwest. Yeah, I think we've got some really hot weather coming, though. Yeah, it's coming our way too. I think I, we've only hit a ninety a few times this summer, but I think we got a stretch of like four or five days right in a row of ninety plus. We're having like corn uh, mature and ready for you know uh, eating. Uh, are you guys similarly paced? Yeah, I think so. Most okay. of ours. You know what? I, we, quite... we drove we drove through your neck of the woods a couple of weeks ago, Ian, and the corn was looking pretty. I think because of that drought, you had this. Yeah. This spring, the corn was looking pretty, I mean, it was alive and growing, but it was pretty low compared to what it normally would have been. Yeah, by us, a lot of the sweet corn got planted late because of that. So it's not very far along. Are you getting vegetables My- from the garden, Ian? We are. Oh, tons of them. Tons of yeah. them. We're already canning tomatoes and uh, canning peppers and things like that. So My lots son, going my, on. My oldest son lives in uh, Texas. Austin. So the summer is just <laughs> ridiculous. I, you know, I, when I check my weather, I usually check the weather back in Minnesota and check it down in Texas. And it's just, you know, a hundred plus hundred plus day after day after day. Ugh. You know, I get, it's like, I've been in that kind of temperature recently and it's kind of like being up North in the cold. You just don't really go outside, right? You, you have to be right. inside or you, it's dangerous. And that was, he was the one son of mine who hated the cold. He hated everything about it. And he does, he never complains about the heat. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, he's in the right place. <laughs> yep. But yeah, that's quite the extreme from Minnesota to, to Southern Texas. Jeff, what have you been up to? Um, nothing major, just a lot of little stuff. Nothing, you know, a lot of You're working on the punch stuff. list to sell your house, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you selling uh, your house, Jeff? No. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that would be um, a nightmare. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Mark, what have you been doing? Are you are you done yet? I'm guessing no, not. No, goodness, no. Yeah. I'm not. I'll never be done. No, I was just uh, I was just telling Ian before the show that it's just this last month or two, it's been a little, well, a month and a half. It's been just a lot of guests, a lot of traveling, a lot of warm weather and it's just in a lot of work i've been really busy at work so we were talking you know it's just if i don't get out there by 
three o'clock, it's hard to get motivated to set up saws and, you know, I'll bring all the tools and then for a half an hour and then clean up for a half an hour, you know, and then get an hour and a half. It's just hard to get into the flow when you don't, <clears throat> when you don't have more than a few hours to do something. I think anyone who's like taking a large home remodeling or building project on their own would agree. It's, it's, uh, you spend a lot of time getting set up and cleaning up yeah. and getting going. Yeah. And I just I told not, we, yeah, you know, we just have not had any weekends to just get into the, get into the, the swing of things. I told Mark what we used to say in the Carpenters Union was nothing new after two. And that's, <laughs> that's what he's got to think about yeah. when he's setting up it, a saw at four o'clock. It's true. And that is true. And it's on a regular job site. You know, it's, it's, uh, that's, you kind of plan your day and, you know, uh, I've been on photo shoots where carpenters have said that very thing. And it, is that real? I mean, uh, it seems like if you're not working until four or five o'clock, you're leaving a lot of time on the table. I think it, it's it's that you're supposed to plan your day a little bit better yeah. so that you, you don't end up with a void at the end of the day. But once you yes. have to switch gears to start doing something else, you're you're wasting time. I When I had a crew, a siding crew of eh, anywhere between – three and four other people we would always meet in the morning and we'd walk around the house you know always plan the house you know working in the shade and where's the wind and where's the muck and try and just plan the day and what this guy's doing that and this. so i'd plan the day every morning and after working with the same guy for I, he never brought it up for like 10 years he said after the meeting he said peterson i don't think one day we've ever finished everything <laughs> that you said we were going to finish <laughs> And I thought about it. I thought, you know what? You're probably right. But I also thought if you don't plan enough, the worst thing that happens is you finish up at 2.30, 3 o'clock for whatever reason, everything goes perfectly. You're kind of hard to get going on anything else. And you end up just kind of twiddling your thumbs and messing around and wasting time. So, yeah, I thought that was funny. I, it, it never occurred to me after it was like 10 years. It's like, you're right. We never do finish everything I, I quit planning to do. So we have an interesting uh, podcast after show today uh, regarding contracts, and this was uh, uh, spawned by a question by one of our listeners, Caleb, who is undertaking his first big remote, uh, building project, building a new home for folks, and uh, he's never done uh, a contract. It's always been handshake deals for his other clients, so uh, it's time to grow up and get the paperwork in order and protect yourself and protect your clients, and we're going to have a conversation about how to do that. Um, we were planning to do this uh, recording uh, a couple days ago, but uh, we wanted to have Ian on the show because you have more experience in, in this, Ian, than any of us. So it seemed like a good fit. So, yeah. Any initial thoughts on it. that? You got to have them. Even a handshake <laughs> yeah. is a is a contract, and it is. those those are the ones that when when things hit the fan, they're the hardest to go back on. But we'll kind of outline yeah. the important parts of it uh, that should be in every every contract that you do. And nowadays it's actually a little bit easier because you do have an email thread yep. where yep. It's, it's less. And if you're careful about that, you'll run into a lot of less of he said, she said, they said, I said type thing. God, it's yep. so important. It's, it's so important for so many reasons. So I, I think it's going to be an awesome conversation. Mm -hmm. Hey, I want to thank my friend uh, Andy Grace who sent me this. Look at this beauty. Oh my God, I'm scared trophy? to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put it right uh, on this trophy shelf, right next to your, your uh, softball trophy. It is an absolutely beautiful uh, drywalling mud pan, and it's even got laser engraved ends. As Ian suggests, it does look like a trophy with its shiny beautifulness. So uh, it's got a round bottom, which is its cool, its attribute, oh, cool. and that prevents you from getting mud stuck in the bottom, right? And That's it's also awesome. raised a little bit so you can pick it up on the bottom. It's not a two-step operation like it is with a conventional mud pan. So um, hmm. thanks, Andy. That is a beauty. Sure is. I might eat out of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we got one other thing to talk about, Ian. And, uh, you know, somewhat sadly, uh, Pro Talk has uh, run its course. Um, we decided to... Uh, put our resources at the company elsewhere and uh, it's nothing you did or our guests did or anything. It's just a matter of we got to do stuff that uh, makes the most revenue for the company is a very simple decision. So, uh, yeah, 
thank you, man. You did an amazing yeah. job, and you should be no, super proud. I appreciate proud. you uh, having me do it after Mark turned you down when you tried to pawn it off on him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and just so people, and I, I may have said this before, but, you know, these podcasts seem like, oh, you just, because uh, a couple times, you know, a year ago or so, uh, Patrick was on vacation and I, and I had to produce these and it's when you're listening to them, it seems like, oh yeah, you just flip a switch and start BSing about something. And there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes, especially for, I think for the pro talk, especially there was a lot, you know, there's a lot of emails and scheduling and rescheduling and tech. It's just, it's a lot of time, Patrick. And I totally appreciate how much time and, and energy you spend on these. Well, you know, I think anything worth doing is some work, and uh, uh, it, it was valuable. Uh, and there's an archive there for folks who haven't heard them all. There's amazing conversations with people who do this day in and day out, and they have a lot of good stuff to share on subjects of every nature. So I hope you'll listen. Um, we're trying to think about other things to, uh, you know, boost the value of the podcast. So if, I hope you'll, uh, if you have suggestions, you'll write them to the podcast email box and tell us what you think. Good, bad, ugly, whatever it is, we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> okay, well, this comes from Roberta. Uh, your comments about damp floors and dehumidification reminded me of my first house. It was brand new. After I first turned the air conditioner on, I found that the carpet was wet. I called a builder who sent out a repairman. While waiting for him, I turned the AC down low in an attempt to dehumidify the space. When the repairman came, he was so astounded by the problem, he showed it to me. The AC drip line came down and ended several inches above and to one side of the drain line it was supposed to drip into. So, of course, it was dripping on the floor and seeping into the carpet. And the AC made it worse. He connected the two lines, and I didn't have that problem again. Roberta in Texas. Roberta, this is one of those things that uh, is uh, overlooked because it's so easy to overlook, right? It does. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because you can, in, in the house, there's several areas like this where it's just the little piddly things you would never think about. You know, you, you protect yourself against freezing pipes and storms and, you know, AC, and all of a sudden you get some piddly little pipe that messes you up. I had, I had something similar in my crawl space. I have a dehumidifier down there for the shoulder seasons. And just recently I went down there and, and it's, and there was a big puddle of water sitting right underneath my water heater because it's right next to the drain. I'm thinking, Oh, great. It's, it looked like it was water heater, but then the dehumidifier drain was right there. And I'm thinking, Oh God, I hope it's that. So I cleaned it up and turned the dehumidifier off and it, luckily it was the water heater, but it's just amazing how you can plan for every scenario. And it's just, these little things seem to kill you. Any HVAC contractor will tell you that condensate is a huge pain in the butt with regard to service calls. It is a frequent problem because I don't know what algae or whatever uh, microorganism gets started in the condensate drains, but they yeah. build up to the point where it occludes it, right, Mark? And it runs mm -hmm. all over the floor right. or makes your drywall ceiling wet or, you know, it can cause a lot of damage. So mm -hmm. much so that like commercial buildings have uh, redundant uh, condensate pans and alarms to alert folks when this stuff isn't draining correctly. Mm -hmm. I had the same problem with my dehumidifier, dude. I had to uh, blow out the little drain with some compressed air, and it seems to be fine now. And and uh, to the point of when you're designing a house, a new house especially, there's just so many things that have to work together. And planning a floor drain is one of those things that it often overlooked. It's like, all right, we got a utility room. Let's just throw a floor drain in there somewhere. <laughs> oh, we'll just put it right in the middle, you know? So, so anybody who walks in is going to kick a, kick a condensate, you know, line loose or bust something or squish it, or it's just, yeah, it's hard. It's, those are one of the things where afterwards like, boy, I wish this drain was over, you know, a foot in that direction. My guess is Roberta that that tradesperson who installed that drain that day was missing an elbow or whatever. And uh, I was like, oh, I'll get to that later uh, yeah. when I come back and just forgot. Yeah. It was after two o'clock probably. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, this comes from Josh. FHB podcast crew, no response or acknowledgement expected, but based on recent podcast topics of unnecessary shutters and how to do dormers well... I thought you might appreciate this photo. The dormer is disturbing slash humorous in that it serves no purpose other than the non-functioning windows providing light to an unfinished, unfinishable attic. 
This is a fairly common design in a sought after development here in Iowa. And I'm not sure it meets the local vernacular, as Patrick would call it. <laughs> Don't get me started about all the roof area feeding into the valley that dumps water into the undersized gutter at the front of the entry. Keep up the great work, Josh. Josh, that uh, like non-functioning dormer thing really baffles me. Like all the <laughs> labor, you know, and yeah. like, oh my gosh, what the heck? It's and it's just yeah. So in I don't know if it, if it made sense, but there's a dormer on top of the house, and it just the window looks into the attic. So it's, it's which is a truss zero, roof, right? It's a truss <laughs> roof. So you really need to like put, climb up into the attics and put some curtains over it, so it looks you know it's not <laughs> obviously ridiculous. As they could have doubled the size of that dormer too, Patrick. It could have been a greedy, useless <laughs> dormer for you. Yeah, I mean, sure, it breaks up the roof line a little bit, but it's funny how these houses and these developments are often designed by designers, not architects, and and not a rip on design designers because there are some really good ones out there. But sometimes they just think, "Hey, let's do this," and let's just do. And there's no really rhyme or reason why there. There's no larger plan. And, and it's, as a side, it's massing, it's, right? They're trying to balance the other part of the house, but right. I think about all the step flashing and the siding and the window oh, and the weird a, roof, and like it's know, dozens of hours to do this thing that does absolutely nothing. I don't. As understand. a siding contractor, and, and for the the way we got paid, it was you know per square, and then you'd add a little bit for a bay or a dormer or something, and it was never even close to worth the amount that was added. You know, it was you were making five bucks an hour if there was a dormer. And when and then when we come across these things, it was just even that much more salt into the wound. It's like, what? It's a dormer that doesn't even do anything? This is terrible. Yeah. Form follow function is not the was not the <laughs> was not the plan on this house. I would and jo wonder Josh, if you're right, the water is gonna go all over the front entryway too. I, I would wonder if there's some regulation within the development that required this dormer to exist for some reason for uh, aesthetics of the homes could very well be yeah so you're most uh, supposed to make stuff silly to uh <laughs> make it better i don't what well there's so, a lot of things where it's like you ha you can only have this percent of you know this type of siding otherwise you have to have stone or and you can't you gotta have shutters and you have to have certain pitches and there's all sorts of yep. rules I'd, I'd be willing to bet if this is a higher end development, as he he alludes to in his letter, that there is something uh, in the the bylaws of the development that regulate what the design of houses is supposed to look like, and it might be that they have to meet a certain farmhouse vernacular, and this is a misguided design attempt to meet that. Yeah, all I heard was misguided. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this comes from Andy. Uh, hey, podcast crew, this is a grim one, but it seemed important. This is regarding a case study he sent me a link to, and I'll include that on the podcast page. In this case study, 52, en 52 engineered stone fabricator patients developed silicosis. The median age was 45 years at the diagnosis, and nearly all were Latino immigrants. The diagnosis was delayed in 58%, while 38 were presenting with advanced disease progressive massive fibrosis, and 19% died. Uh, meaning, in California, silicosis associated with occupational exposure to dust from engineered stone uh, primarily occurred among young Latino immigrant men. Many patients presented with severe disease, and some cases were fatal. Uh, Andy says, this is a particularly high death rate. I wonder if consumer pressure might help approve safety protocols at these manufacturers. It would also be interesting to see how natural stone manufacturers compare that is grim, Andy. Yeah, you know, and I, you know, I, when I'm driving around, I see people cutting concrete and I never see them wearing respiratory protection ever, never. No. And it's the worst. I mean, besides obviously the uh, asbestos is about as bad as you can get, but it really is. And, it, and you can tell just, I mean, if you're doing around this stuff or, you know, back in the day, you get home and it's just, you can tell there's some, it, your lungs and your back of your throat are not feeling great. But in, in two, you know, what's weird, though, is he said that uh, this study, particular study, was about uh, countertop. Yeah, like and, a and quartz uh, composite. Yeah, it seems is like what, most of yeah. the fabrication for those is done in the shop. I mean, there's no excuse not to have really top-notch dust collection in, you know, in a shop somewhere. 
You have to make people do it though, because it gets to be this machismo thing is like, right. oh yeah, I don't need that. Right. I was just for the very first time I had, I had to shoot something for a story I'm working on. It was just grinding concrete. So I had a little four and a half, five inch grinder and I had to do it indoors for the shoot. And I, so I bought the little, uh, this little surround, this uh, surrounding thing that, you know, with a little broom brush bristles on the bottom that goes around a shroud that goes around the, um, uh, the grinder, the grinder wheel and it hooks mm -hmm. up to a vacuum cleaner. I could not believe how well that thing worked. It was flipping amazing. And the reason I could tell the difference is because I was, you know, I was doing this, turning it off, turning it on, shooting it. Well, by accident, I turned it on once without the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and in five seconds, the whole room was just filled yeah. with dust. Oh, and there's really no excuse. And in 2017, OSHA, you know, I think that was when OSHA increased these regulations. So now it's not just dangerous. There's just no excuse for it. And you'll get in trouble if you know, OSHA guy drives by and sees a cloud of dust when it just, that just should, doesn't need to be that. I way. mean, it's so much more comfortable. Jeez. I, if for that, for, for no other reason than that, you should uh, be protecting yourself just so you're not hacking while you're trying to work. Yeah. Uh, and most masonry tools now have cuttings and drilling. They have either built in or really good options. Like I mentioned that just that work so well. And there's so many more options now than there was. Yeah. Years. And, and, uh, you suggested, uh, you know, you need to turn on the vac, but there are also vacs that turn on automatically. Now, when you turn yeah. on the electric tools, even if they're cordless, they will turn on the vac with Bluetooth. It's pretty cool. Right. Mm -hmm. This comes from, uh, Polly on the FHB forum. Hey y'all, I've gotten some conflicting information while searching forums and I found some articles about the proper way to insulate a floor from above, uh, above an uncondition unconditioned space. I'm building a six by 12 room on a pier foundation with two beams and want to insulate it well enough to use during the winter time. My layers from the top down would be one subfloor, two vapor barrier, three R30 faced insulation, three A two by 10 floor joist, four one inch thick rigid foam uh, to break the thermal bridge on the bottom of the floor joist. Exterior sheathing is the final layer. The conflicting information comes from the rigid foam being used. Would this create a second vapor barrier where moisture would now be trapped between the rigid foam and the vapor barrier below my subfloor? I've attached a PDF to show the assembly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what do you guys think? Are we going to have a problem with two, two, two vapor barriers? Skip the vapor barrier and use something like zip on the underneath is a detail I've seen used frequently. What about the uh, craft face bats? Is that a good idea, or should we omit the craft facing on the fiberglass? I would, bat yeah. yeah. I would actually dense pack it or blow it full of mineral wool or something like that that can deal with a little bit of uh, water should it get in the assembly. So if I'm reading this right, is there a like a plastic sheet type vapor barrier un directly under the subfloor in this diagram? I think that's what, that's what he's talking about. Yeah. Well, I, my question, my first question is how do you properly attach the subfloor to the floor joists without it? I mean, you can't use adhesive. So, I mean, you just go, go crazy with screws, I guess, but boy, that, that adhesive I found really with, uh, cause I've come across floors without adhesive. You know, well, they all used to be that way back in the day. I was going to say, really you can, we can build <laughs> floors without adhesive. <laughs> right. No, you can. But if you want a squeaky floor, I mean, that's the way to go. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you need the, the vapor barrier uh, on the top side. Um, and that allows some drying if something does have mm -hmm. seasonal wetting or whatever. So, Because it's not going to dry through the foam. Right. And you're going to presumably have a conditioned space above. So, Jeez, walking on and just walking on floor joists with plastic would be dangerous and impossible oh you mean while you're doing it oh yeah yeah oh, i just yeah. i don't know yeah that just seems like it would be not a great plan for plastic under the subfloor um but i think other than that Polly, i think you got it nailed uh i like uh some people want to leave off the exterior sheathing on the underside but i think uh you risk animals getting through the foam layer which would be no big deal for them and Ian, I think the code is, and it all depends on where you're at, right? I mean, does it matter right. if he's in a hot or cold, uh, you know, extremely hot or extremely cold uh, part of the country? I think, if I recall, the code on this is fairly vague. Do you recall what it is, Ian? 
I don't, but I, I know that it does get pretty vague when you're doing this on on the piers, but I would look at it in the same way as you're building your wall or roof assembly just kind of flipped over and you know pointed down instead of pointed out or up and try and follow the same uh, the same line of thought as you would with your wall assembly and roof assembly and then make sure that you're connecting your uh, your exterior sheathing all the way around. Hey, I got a quick, um, I got a, I had a quick unrelated question for you guys. And I, I keep, for, I've been meaning to ask somebody about this for a, a dozen times. So in the code, 2021 code, when, you know, you have to put a vapor barrier or a vapor retarder, retarder under the concrete slab in the basement, we'll say. And it used to be six mil. And so it was a class one vapor retarder, I think they, they, they call it. So in 2021, they changed that requirement to, to 10 mil. And, and not every jurisdiction or municipality probably right. adopted that. But, so, but does that mean that a six mil no longer classifies as a class one vapor retarder? Or are they just, you they know? They want tougher plastic, Mark. I, I don't think it has to do anything with the vapor transmission. Okay, it's so it's mainly just for walking around and poking holes in it. I, I think it has oh. something to do with the degradation over time of the six mil poly that it just in studies it's shown to not last as long uh -huh. and once it starts to disintegrate underneath your concrete it's not doing you any good anymore so in, in other words the six mil is stop if it's installed perfectly the in the first year light you know first part of its life it's working the same exact way as a 10 mil it's just it's going to last long it's just longevity thing yeah Okay. My guess is that the plastics industry lobbied the uh, code uh, <laughs> uh, body you know, to uh, make a sticker six poly. Mil? Yeah, have you priced <laughs> six mil to ten? There's a big jump from ten six mil to ten mil in cost, and, big, and big an jump. even bigger jump to virgin material ten mil, like uh, Stego wrap, mm, which yeah. I think we just we just bought a roll of that at like six hundred some dollars oh. a roll. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, uh, Polly, make sure you detail your uh, subfloor sheathing as an air barrier because it is. And if mm -hmm. you have holes in that, you're going to have potentially um, conditioned yeah. air getting into your floor assembly, which you definitely don't want because of yeah. vapor, vapor. So do that, and uh, I think you'll have a great assembly. And make sure you uh, tape the bottom of the um, sheathing too. You like zip under there, right? Ian, yep. is that what you said? And I, I yeah. want to say that's what John Beer was using uh, at his house where we saw uh, he had a very similar structure that was being built the day you and I visited him. Uh, and Matt Milham did a piece called uh, Air Sealed and on Piers, which is a similar assembly. And yeah. uh, because they had so little room under that build, they actually built the floor raised and then lowered it into its yep. final position, which I thought was pretty cool. So I'll link that on the podcast page. I can't wait to talk about Chris's question here. Do you guys see these photos that, oh my goodness. Okay, let's get right into it. Dear FHB team, I'm a contractor who is about to embark on my most ambitious project yet, my own home. We bought a 4,500 square foot, 100 year old post and beam constructed warehouse slash glorified shed. It used to be a carriage house for the town's ice house. The train would deliver fresh ice to the ice house at the front of the property, and then the carriages would deliver it throughout the town. Our plan is to make it a live slash work building. Unfortunately, over the years, a lot of the structure has started to sag and it needs a ton of work. I have a structural engineer who has given us plans on replacing the structure as needed and spec'd out hardware and shear walls. But my biggest question is how you would sequence the shoring up and replacement of posts and truss elements and joists. We've all, we will also be pouring new footings for every single post and an entirely new slab, although the perimeter foundation will mostly be left untouched with the exception of a couple locations that need to be filled in. We're in the Bay Area and California, so energy efficiency, isn't, efficiency usually isn't the most front of mind since it's so mild here. But since you tend to be interested in that, we'll be doing a flash and bat install on the ceiling to get the required R value, mineral wool bats in the walls. I don't have any special plans for air sealing or anything like that. We will not have radiant in the floor, so we won't be doing any insulation under the slab 
unless you think there is a significant reason to do so. I'm sure I'll have a million other questions as things progress. I can send more pics if you like. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, who wants to describe this structure for our audience? Go for it, Mark. It is a big kind of a barn. It's almost, I mean, if you look at it like from a distance, it almost looks like a big tall pole barn. But it's in the walls are what? Probably, well, it's kind of, it's almost like I got a gambrel roof. So it comes out, there's a pitch on either side, and then maybe a gambrel roof or a really low pitch roof uh, up top. It's kind so, of like a very shallow, clear story is how yeah. I might describe that with a pair of shed roofs and like a low pitch gable above them uh, in the middle. Does that seem like a the, fair? Yeah. 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 And it looks like there's maybe four by sixes as the roof holding the, the tin roof up, the purlins that hold the tin roof up and a couple cross braces and big old timbers. I mean, it's, it's, it really has a lot of potential. It's a neat structure. I would describe it as a house of cards. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he's got the engineering already done, I mean, he, he knows that whatever needs to be done is, is a doable thing, so he's moving forward. But it's the question is how do you shear? I mean, I've done plenty of, of projects where you have to shear up walls, but we're talking, you know, eight or 10 foot walls, and you just, you know, to remove, to add a header, to add an extra center beam or something like that, and you just build temporary walls next to those on either side of them and do your work and then remove them when you're done. But these walls are, you know, they're 16 feet tall or taller, tw maybe 20 feet at the top. And frankly, they look like they were built with whatever was lying around the ice shed that day. Uh, <laughs> and and yep. over time, you know, this building probably was a utility structure its entire life and its construction reflects that. Yeah. I mean, the other thing, we, I did one project where we had to blow out the whole back of a house, in which case we use cribbing, I think eh, three or three, maybe two or three different areas where we did cribbing and then some big beams to hold up. But there again, it was an eight foot tall ceiling. And this is, I mean, that's a lot of cribbing. So, yeah, I was going to say that yeah, too, Mark. I, I think he needs a house mover or and that's someone where we who's, got our cribbing. Yeah, my grandpa was, was really a house used mover. to uh, creatively lifting and straightening large structures like this. So I, I think he a, needs a house mover. Yeah, and they're going to have a yard full of cribbing, and this will be. They'll look at it and they'll know exactly what what needs to be done. The nice thing too that uh, a lot of house movers can do is they can take your engineering info and they can build that into their strategy so that when they're actually cribbing up the structure, the members that they're using for cribbing will be your final headers that will just get attached into place once the right. building is straightened out. They can, they can do a lot of creative work and I've worked with a few of them and they, they tend not to be as expensive as you would think. Uh, mm -hmm. that type of work is. Yeah, that's a good point. At the very least, they need to know the plan because if they put their cribbing up in an area where you got to put a, you know, it could all be in the way. So yeah, you got to work close with them on the future plan. That's, but yeah, that's a good, that's a good route to go. I'd like to hear Jeff's thoughts on this project. <laughs> I think the whole place should be dismantled, save the <laughs> elements for decorative <laughs> I, I totally agree, Jeff. I totally agree. And you know, some you know stuff, what, though, and, this, and this is somebody who worked on supremely junky houses at Habitat for Humanity, like stuff that should have been bulldozed. I try and save everything I can, but boy, I really question the rationale of trying to work with this very, very beat up structure. He's in the Bay. I mean, he didn't mention it, but he's in the Bay Area and there may be historical uh, preservation rules that he's working with. And there may also just be the cost of square footage in that area. It's what the second oh. or third most expensive area in North America, the Bay Area. So it's not. Know, he, there's there's ones that are more expensive than that. That's, hard. That's yeah. We're we're Patrick and Jeff live in Greenwich. <laughs> is more expensive. <laughs> right. Um. So, uh, the the saving grace for this entire project is that this building is going to be very valuable when it is built, right. when it is finished. Right. Mm -hmm. So the you know you can spend some money on this thing and still have some equity. Yep. Um, but boy, I would really talk to the structural engineer about uh, either recreating this building um, or using steel to selectively uh, strengthen it. And then uh, for what amounts to a steel timber frame, 
yep. steel frame to hold the thing up and then build uh, exterior walls to create an envelope. And yep. uh, I don't know. But yeah, as far as, it, it, as far as getting it done, like you said, Ian, it, for, a, for a good house mover, this is a walk in the park. Yeah, especially with all that space. And I think if you had an engineer look at it, uh, I mean, he didn't send any engineering plans, but you got to think steel is heavily involved in the engineering plans here. So mm -hmm. getting that house mover in there, taking advantage of that big open space and cribbing it, I don't, I don't think that's a terribly difficult job. And maybe just because he's in a, a pretty temperate area and doesn't need the the uh, insulation and air sealing that we're used to needing where we all live uh, might be a saving grace for the, the budget of this job. It's a lanai. <laughs> it should be a lanai, right? It should be like, uh, yeah. Um, this thing has got to stand up in an earthquake too, which is yeah. another consideration. There is yeah. no way this thing has got sheer uh, resistance in any way. That's what I'm thinking. It's got to be a, a steel grid holding that entire building up. All the more reason to use a house mover. Mm -hmm. I love it. I think it's going to be cool when you're done. Send us pictures. Amen. It's an amazing building. And uh, I sure admire anyone who wants to say something of this historic nature. I think it's awesome. You volunteering to come and uh, photograph this uh, when it's all finished as a case study for fine home building, Mark? January. Yep. <laughs> You're going to do it in January. <laughs> Chris, you got until January. <laughs> four months from now. Right. January it's of gonna what year, It's going to take four months Mark. to get through permitting. Right. It doesn't guess. matter which, what year it is, just January. <laughs> yeah, how is he going to permit this? We, we didn't even touch on that. That is oh the most notoriously difficult area to permit anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if he's got the – I mean, if he started right with it, I mean, he started – the only way to start is with a structural engineer. So, Chris, please email me how, what you spent for this building because uh, uh, I, I would love to know. And um, if you don't want me to tell the rest of the podcast audience, I won't. But I'm sure folks are curious. And if you want to see this uh, rather ambitious project, I hope you'll go to the podcast page and check out the show uh, notes and the photography there because I'm not sure we can do it justice. I, I think you should put him in contact with Jess and see if you can make him the FHB house of 25 <laughs> and 26 <laughs> for this remodel. I think it's awesome. You know, I don't know if it's intentional, but Chris put up a, a laser uh, to show uh, the respective um, square plum level of this structure. And uh, yeah. <laughs> It's not. It's not no. in any way. No. <laughs> all right. Well, if you all have uh, thoughts on what Chris should do with this building, I hope you'll share it with the podcast. This comes from Tom. Hello, FHB podcast. When Apple stopped including first floppy disk drives and then CD drives from its computers and then took away the headphone jack from the iPhone, there was an initial shock, but then a realization that it was time to move on from those technologies if Apple were to, to design a house, I am quite confident that there wouldn't be a single medium-based light socket anywhere. The possibilities with LEDs are so much more varied, but Apple doesn't design houses, and moving beyond standard light sockets is not easy. In response to your discussion in episode 583 about doing an article about the nuts and bolts of LED strip light installations, I say yes, please. I really like what LED strip lights can do, but haven't really found a way to install them in a method that isn't somewhat slapdash. The first installation I've done to get an effect that wouldn't really have been possible without LEDs is the reach-in bedroom closet in our 1941 house. I put LED strip lights around the door trim on the interior of the closet, and the result is a bright, even light that lets us clearly see everything at all levels of the closet. I also put an under cabinet light in the kitchen using LED strip tape, that was dense enough so that mounted in an aluminum channel with a frosted lens, one gets an unbroken line of light. But for these and other installations, I want the LEDs hardwired instead of plugged into a receptacle. I don't want an inline switch or a power cord. I don't want controllers with batteries that need to be replaced or that rely on an app that could stop working in a few years. 
dimming on the 24 volt DC side of the transformer using pulse width modulation is far superior to dimming on the AC side. So much of what's available seems like it's for hobbyist projects and not permanent home installations. The world needs a comprehensive FHB article or two or three showing us appropriate electronics and hardware and best practices for putting it all together. Where do we locate the transformers? Is it better to use one large transformer for several LED strips or one for each installation? How do we safely and legally route the wiring for both the 120 volt AC and the 24 volt DC electricity? Are standard wall switches still the best way to turn the light on and off, or are they just a relic that we need to move beyond? Please help us move to the next generation of lighting design. Um, I couldn't agree more with everything Tom says. The stuff that you can buy now seems like it's for model railroading in my estimation. And this like wacky little remote control I have for the LEDs above my uh, office desk here, it doesn't strike me as like real wiring. And, and <laughs> I, I totally agree with what he, what he says. It, it doesn't seem like the stuff is up to, you know, decades of use potentially. You guys agree, disagree? I totally agree. Ian, have you done, have you messed around with the uh, LED lights? Just in kitchens and they're always more trouble than they're worth in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. I just had to go to my mother-in-law's house to fix one that I installed. And I, and I think I mentioned on a previous podcast, I, the company that makes these little connectors basically said their own connectors are crap. You got to get uh, the, the snap together connectors are crap. You got to buy this, you know, the soldered ones. And I'm like, well, I don't have, I don't have a little soldering gun that can go that small, but yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's very surprising that they're so popular and there isn't a standard, a standard way of installing them. And as far as the transformers go, yeah, you really kind of have to do the math. I mean, you buy a line, you figure out how many lights are on that line and then you have to buy the appropriate transformer. So buying- But it's not a, even that easy because he asks a bunch of good questions. Do you put a bunch of LEDs on a single transformer? Do you switch them on the line voltage side or on the DC, on the low voltage side? I, like these are all questions I have. And well, the transformers usually, the ones that, the transformers that I bought and I bought like two or three different sizes depending on the lines. And this is my most recent, the under cabinet job and the trans they're small enough where they fit up under the cabinets, you know, fine. But the, so there, there was a switch. I mean, the way they were wired is you had the switch side, you know, the AC coming in and the DC going out. So that really wasn't an option to switch it on the, on the AC side. I don't think, or on the DC side, I don't think. Well, you can but, with these silly things like I have, right? It's, uh, oh, sure. A little, yeah, you yeah, know, yep. Yeah. Yeah. But then you're. But if you want a standard wall switch, yeah, you're switching it on the AC. You're switching side. it on the AC side. But one tip I will have that I, that I think, if you can get away with it, in, in between, in sometimes you can on cabinets. But so you, what you do is a lot of times there's a, a line of lights. You know, you have your transformer, and sometimes in between the transformer and the lights, or in between one strain of lights and the other lights, they'll just be low voltage wiring connecting those. So the deal is those little connectors from the low voltage wires in between whites, in between lights, if you can get away with it, add a little, <laughs> add a little length to them. Because if you have to cut off a couple, you know, if they're super tight and you all of a sudden your connection's bad and you're, for whatever reason, you have to redo your connection on that strip light, you can't snip off a centimeter and then there, there's no room to extend that low voltage light. So if you make a little slack and just when you pull it down, if you have to fix something, it's just easier if there's a little slack in that low voltage wiring. Found out, actually, no, I didn't I, find out that the hard way. I, I did that just because it was easier. I, was, I wasn't even thinking about repairs, but uh, when I had to do a repair, I'm like, oh boy, am I glad I have this little extra loop in the, in the low voltage wires. I commonly see electricians do that in line voltage stuff too. Like can lights often have a loop or two of yeah. uh, cable up there, right? So in case you have to move it down the line or you want to change fixtures, right, Ian? Isn't that a pretty yeah. customary thing? Yeah. I would like to hear I mean, what any of the uh, electricians out there who listen to us and specifically do residential work think uh, about LEDs. My personal feeling is that it's likely one of those design elements that has no foundational rooting 
in the vernacular building techniques of the people who are tasked with putting it together, which is why you probably don't see it. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just, it's too far removed from standard operating practice of electricians. So I, because I'd like so to hear. Many, yeah. yeah. And there's so it's many not the wiring they're trained and, in, right? It is a yeah. different yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you and have this highly yeah. skilled person making loads of money an hour costing a project tons of money and now you're like hey look at this cool light that you've never seen before and you're not trained <laughs> yeah. in installing uh, right. why why don't you want to use it well yeah you're going to pay some electrician 125 dollars an hour for an entire day to figure out your goofy little <laughs> led right. lights you can have purple you're, lights under your cabinets yeah that, like like patrick said the train set it yeah. When I asked, well, I know what some elect, I know what my electricians had to say about it. They said we don't mess with it ever. Yep. <laughs> it's just too, just what you said. It's just there's too many. Don't types. want to do with it. There's no standards. They're finicky. You got to, you know, they're, they're they just, yeah, they just flat out refused, which yep. is why I did, I did it myself. But it turned out it was kind of fun. But, uh, but I yeah, had a conversation with yeah. Samantha about why this is important FHB content. And uh, my, my, my reasoning was these lights open up endless possibilities of different ways to light up stuff. I mean, the, the, and safely potentially, but they have to be reliable and it, it, it has to be something that uh, electricians feel confident installing that they're not going to have headaches later. And that's the only way this is going to be uh, accepted or in my mind, worthwhile. It needs to work. Yeah. It's no, there's definitely a place for it. And it's just one of those odd things that it just seems like the industry would have decided on some some sort of standard. Some sort of standard connector, some sort of standard, you know, lighting side. I mean there's three different kinds of lighting strips I think you can buy. You know, a six millimeter, eight millimeter, ten millimeter, something like that. So you buy connectors for one. It's just a mess. You know what this reminds me of? The early days of AC lighting and uh, power, too, is there was, you know, um, primitive enclosures, uh, unstandard methods of wiring. You know, I've taken down ceiling fixtures in old Pittsburgh houses and found gas lines run to the electrical box. Okay. And I've learned from podcast listeners that that was actually pretty typical because they didn't know which uh, you know, central lighting was going to be ultimately adopted. Right. Um, I've seen Edison electric... hadn't barbecued that elephant yet to show <laughs> yeah, the right. superiority of his just a few, uh, design. Just a few dogs and, you know, Patrick, yeah, when, we, when there you were first still started AC that sentence... and DC uh, discussions uh, in <laughs> cities around the country, you know, we... I, I'm guessing this will get worked out, but I'm not sure we're there yet. Yeah. Uh, when, we, Mark, when you started you're... that topic, Trip Patrick, I thought, how old are you? What do you mean? The beginning? <laughs> it reminds you of the beginning of AC wearing. I'm like, geez, you got to be 120 <laughs> years old. <laughs> I guess it, the things I've seen that are in old houses, right, is what, what I really yeah. mean. Yeah. And, and what were you saying, Ian? I'm sorry. Uh, your, the transformers that you have for yours, do they run pretty cool or do you need to have them in an area where they can uh, dissipate their heat? I have mine open, so they're tucked up underneath the outside uh, lip of the cabinet. So, I, you know what? I never put my hand on them. I don't know how hot they were. But one of the one of the, the one of the connectors in my mother-in-law's place had a little one of the contact points had a little brown p potentially burning going on around there. So it's like, geez, what? I, I found yeah. some of those things to just be smoking hot after they they run for a long time. I don't know if they've gotten any better in the years since I last installed them on cabinets. They are. Has nice, anyone though. looked at the really uh, energy amazing. consumption just, of these things? That's something that I yeah. wonder about. So LEDs have the great potential to save us electricity, uh, but if you're running a transformer that's you know 60, right. 100 watts, uh, what are you saving <laughs> right. yep. versus an Edison-based bulb? Yeah, these watts. I think my the watts on my transformers are boy anywhere from ten. To, I don't think I even had a twenty. Because it, it doesn't take much to run them. But the, the one thing we haven't mentioned, the end result of really well put together cabinet lights is amazing. I mean, it's so nice to have your cabinets lit or your countertops lit up like that. Oh, yeah. And Tom's suggestion to put it on the interior casing of a closet. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's how do you how, how more elegantly can you solve that problem of a dark closet? Are you going to go up in the attic and run cables to the top? But it's still not going to light up all the stuff because it's from right. above, right? 
Just yeah. make sure you put your switch on the inside. My fr a friend of mine is building a house just asked me, and it actually might be a good question for Ian and, and maybe even me, because I, although I didn't come up with too many, but he asked me, he's building a house and he said, what would you do differently? You know, not forgetting, I mean, there's lots you, that you would do differently if you had an extra million dollars, but just given what you did, what would you do differently? And one of the, one of the simple things was the light switch to the walk-in closet I put on the outside of the door just because I thought, well, there's going to be shelves and whatever in the way inside. And that was just dumb because now if somebody's sleeping and wants to walk in there, they got to flip on the lights and it lights up the whole room where they, you know, before they could kind of tuck themselves into the closet and then flip the lights on. It's just one of those little uh, we things. We should tell where, folks, so you have a walk-in closet and if you'd had the switch yes. on the inside, you could turn the light on after you're in there. I gotcha. Yep, yep. Correct. So one of those little things. You're not tempted sure to you, put that switch yeah. on the other side of the wall. That wouldn't be a big lift. It works good enough. <laughs> well, eventually, maybe, but that's way, way down on my priority list. Maybe you could, one uh, of these little remote controls like I got. <laughs> right. Well, I was going to say you could change it over to uh, a Pico switch setup, and then you could have the remote mounted in a inside regular uh, switch box on the inside. Yep. That's yep, what I then, did for all of our uh, light switches to avoid running uh, regular three-way wiring setups everything's on pico switches really yep. everything in your entire house yep huh interesting was that a fhb house sponsor no no that was <laughs> that was something that i had wanted to do i i wanted to have the the remote controlled and voice controlled light setup and the easiest way to do it is with uh lutron setup and their bridge and then taking it one step further just doing everything as uh Pico switches instead of uh, three-way wiring setups, which my electrician did not understand at all until he ran the wiring. And then he was like, man, I'm suggesting this to everybody. That saved <laughs> me so much wiring and huh. so much time. All you have to do uh, is so go there, around do, and set them up. Do there have to be communication up. cables to everything too, Ian? How's that no, work? No, it's all wireless through the uh, wireless uh, Wi-Fi bridge. Have you so had I any have a, like a small box. Up, update issues or anything like that? None at all. It, have, did you, when you built your house, did you explore or investigate the low voltage, uh, the low voltage, you doing your whole entire lighting system on low voltage wires, you know, running cat, I think they run off a of cat five or cat six, maybe. No, we didn't look into any of that. The one thing that I did was, uh, we cheaped out on disc lights everywhere, but the reason we chose disc lights was so that we would have an actual box in the wall and in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. rather so that we could change it over to any type of hanging fixture at a later date but went with the you know 499 disc lights uh, yep. to suffice for now jeff what are your thoughts on this have you played around with this led stuff uh not not strip lighting but you know with little led fixtures under cabinet lighting fixtures and things like that so i've Got that, got Does that. it seem like toys to you? Uh, you know, I mean, I've had under cabinet light for twenty five years, so I, I, you know, I can't live without having under cabinet lights. So I've gone from little grain of wheat incandescent bulbs to little halogen discs to LEDs, and you know, I it just. I, I think it's definitely the way to go for that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I've replaced all my can lights with LED, you know, fixtures and things like that. So not just LED bulbs, but you've done the conversion kits. Is that what I understand? No, and your they're, can lights? No, they're basically, you know, they're, they're the conversions. They're not. They screw into the Edison uh, base, and it's a little wafer, right? That's yeah, got some springy exactly. things on it. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, um, I did that in our entire house in New York, and I was like blown away by the energy savings from the uh, the cheap old Halo cans that were were in the house. It, dozens upon dozens of them uh, in the house, and when I switched them over, it was a a good difference in the energy bill. I just, and LED, I mean, there's so many advantages to LEDs. I just love the fact that you can change the cut. You know, a lot of the fixtures you buy now, you can change the color to, you know, 
to mimic daylight or softer colors, you know, so it's just, it really makes a big difference. But in most of those, you can only set it at the, uh, the box above the ceiling. So you have to set right. it and then yep. throw it up and, there and hope you get it right. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's frustrating when you get them all done. It's like, oh, geez, I two, forgot to change two of them. And now you got two bolts up there that you got to yep. get the ladder out and climb back up there and <laughs> tweak them. Uh, you know, I would describe it as a sea change in lighting technology. Uh, you know, we're, we're in the new chapter and uh, I think it's very promising, but I would sure love someone who feels like they have a handle on what the good equipment is and what the good connection strategies are switching all of it to contact fine home building about what I think is a pretty important uh, feature for yeah. our I talked our to audience. a lighting uh, owner of a lighting store once and he said that LED the, the LED technology has been set back by the really the cheap china stuff for a decade yeah. And he said the, and, and I'm guessing that the LED light switch, cause there wasn't, I, you know what? I search for American made products when I can, and there wasn't anything and not an LED lighting. So maybe it's one of those things where the Syl Sylvania or the Phillips or the GEs, the prices, you know, there's so many cheap dirt, cheap ones out there. It's just not worth them for them to get into it and have something that costs literally three, four, something that works properly, but costs three, four or five times more than what's available. So. And we love would, dirt cheap goods. We sure do. Uh, one thing I've observed is if you want new technology accepted in the HVAC industry, the supply houses host uh, clinics uh, a Saturday morning or a morning with coffee and donuts and show folk new equipment and have a rep there and talk about you know, what the advantages are, what the potential gotchas are about this new equipment. And I think if the lighting business had something similar to discuss good products with regard to uh, LED strip lights and fixtures, we would be further ahead. But like you said, I don't know if any of our good manufacturers are making that stuff yet. Um, contracts in the after show. You got a uh, teaser, Ian, you want to give folks to encourage them to become All Access members? Well, I think you've, no matter what type of work you're doing, if you are the one putting yourself on the line and taking the risk associated with doing work in, in other people's homes, um, you, you've got to have contracts to protect yourself and set good expectation levels between you and your client. If that doesn't get you to subscribe, I don't know what will. Well said. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Mark, Ian, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please, 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 please like, comment, review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep Craft alive. I hope you become an all-access member.